Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Coffee Cup Podcast. This is episode 90. Today, I have a special treat for you all, an interview with none other than Robbie Andrews. Now, Robbie was super humble in this in the interview that we did, so I just want to shout him out and give some context for how amazing he is for those who aren't aware. His 800-meter PB is 144, and he's also run 334 for the 1500. He was an NCAA champ, champ, U.S. champ, and a U.S. Olympian, and, you know, we just had an amazing talk, so I really hope you guys enjoy this interview. Next week, the boys will be back, so that'll be more of a regular episode, but for today, please enjoy. And I'm here with Mr. Robbie Andrews. Robbie, how you doing today? Hey Morgan, uh, thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I just had a nap today, so I'm feeling pretty good. Feeling pretty good after the nap. You had what did you have for your run today? I had five whole miles. Uh, my I had my first workout back after an injury yesterday, um, so today's run didn't feel too good. But uh, I did have five miles and I, I made it through. So thanks for asking. That'll get you. So Robbie and I are both sad. Well, every time I'm injured and I'm on my own, <laughs> I always put myself back into Sad Boys Track Club. And we're on pretty similar, actually we're on extremely similar paths in that regard because for both of us, we're here without our partners, we're coming back from injury and just in general, the whole team is here, isn't here, sorry, like, so it's always a different vibe when it's just like no one's here. So we're kind of just out here grinding and yeah, we're both coming back from injuries. So we're actually going to be linking up a little bit. I think (laughs) on Thursday, we're going to be working out together. In some capacity, that's my hope. That's my dream. Maybe. You excited uh, for that? I'm very I'm excited to warm up with you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're very modest. Robbie Robbie is very modest. Um just just for everyone who's listening, um, who is Robbie Andrews? Uh, that's a tough question. So, yeah, I'll give you a I'll tell you my answer I, after you right. give yours. I'll give you a, a nutshell, um, a big nutshell. Uh but I, I, I grew up in, in New Jersey, in uh, Manalpa, New Jersey, about an hour south of uh, New York City and about an hour north of or east of uh, Philadelphia. And um, my, my dad was a runner, my mom was a runner, my sister's a runner. Uh, so I grew up in a family of runners and uh, I was just kind of exposed to the sport super early in like a very, uh, I don't know, uh, open way. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't like I was training, my dad was training my sister and me from like a young age. It was just kind of like, well, I'm going to the track today. Do you guys want to come? And me and my sister would always be like, well, yeah, mm-hmm. it was just normal. <laughs> Which is, yeah, we were just having fun. And, um, and then when, when we got, when I got to middle school, um, I still wanted to be a basketball player, but, uh, I was, I did play basketball, but I was much better at running. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess uh got really fucking good in high school. Yeah. <laughs> my senior year, yeah. What was your high school uh, mile time? My I ran 403 and 148. And back then that's like a 355 like today time. People didn't run that quick back then, did they? Um Mac Fleet had the number one time that year, 4029 and uh uh I think I think Centro had run 403 like mm-hmm. a year or two before that. It was like a lot of guys around like that 402 403 404 range. Um yeah, definitely not what you're seeing today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you went to the University of Virginia. This is this is the quick run through. We'll get more oh, yeah. in depth later. But you went to Virginia, and as a freshman, you you were pretty fucking good, <laughs> pretty quick. Yeah, uh, I got I got very lucky with um, with the school and, and coach I picked uh, with Jason Vigilante, and uh, we just had a really good group of guys. But yeah, I was able to to win NCAA indoor in the 800. And then I got second outdoor in the 800 at NCAs and, uh, as a freshman. And then as a sophomore, I redshirted. Uh, no, and then that summer I got third. I got bronze at the World Junior Championship. Um, me and Kaz Loxham, we went 2-3 behind a, a Kenyan who didn't last much longer in the sport. So. <laughs> I'll do it sometimes. But yeah, I got a World Junior medal. And, uh, and then the next year, I'd had that actually, I ran that race with really bad plantar fascia. Um, I, I remember uh, the, the the night before the final, I went out to dinner with my my dad and Coach Vidge, and um, you know I'd been they had known my foot was hurting me for like a while, but um, as I'm walking back to the the dorm or whatever, I'm like up on my toe and I'm like I can't oh, I can barely walk, and Vidge just turns around, and he's like, 
hey, take some Advil. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe pop a couple of Advil tonight. And um, so then when I got back to school, so because that was late late July, and um, so then when I got back to school that August, um, I hadn't been running yet because I was taking my two week break, and uh, Vidge got me into our our doctor, and um, so we got an MRI, and they said my navicular was broken, and I was like, oh wow, that's weird because the bottom of my foot hurts like. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. I, I don't think my navic- like my navicular is fine, but so I get on crutches for for seven weeks, and then um, Vidge takes me down to see uh, I forget his last name, but Doctor Bob in Raleigh, uh, who had just done Evan Jager Je- Evan Jager's navicular, like a few months before that, and then Jager was like fine, but so he took me down to see this guy for my navicular, and like we're waiting in the waiting room for like way too long, and he's like, sorry to keep you guys waiting, but like what are you doing here, man? Like, your navicular? What do you... Like, it looks like planner, but your navicular is totally fine. Wow. And I... My... Both of our... They drove me down. Our faces just dropped. Like, our... You know, that's what we thought. But anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> then I, I had a red shirt uh, indoor that next year because I was still coming back from planner. And then um, and then I won NCAAs as, as a sophomore in 2011. And then the next year I went, I went pro after the cross-country season. Mm-hmm. And then had a great pro career, which we'll get into as well. And then here in Boulder today, wait, can I just ask, do you listen to the podcast? Some of them, yeah. I've just realized that I've never interviewed someone one-on-one. There's always at least three people. I'm pretty sure. This is really intimate. Just you and me, dog. Are you feeling this energy or is this? Oh, dude. Well, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> I'm feeling it. I don't know. It's just, it's a very different <laughs> vibe. I've never thought this before on the show. This is, this is crazy to me. But uh, yeah, so now you live here in Boulder. We uh we hang out from time to time. Watch the Portland Track Fest. Yeah, the whole thing. The whole thing. We watched <laughs> it all. Very exciting stuff. Um, and we played a little bit of Super Smash Bros. We so for context, we talked about that. I talked about it with Ollie and George, um, on earlier because they're just playing that all the time right now in St. Moritz. Mario Kart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With uh with Yard and he's just whooping their butts apparently. Uh, I've I've heard the uh, I've heard the reports that he's uh he's very good. <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> but I think we'll probably get into a bit more of that after this. All right. But yeah. So how did you end up here in Boulder then? I ended up ended up in Boulder because uh, my beautiful wife Josette uh, Norris Andrews uh, joined the OAC. And um, I think she's your I think she's your newest member. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, when uh, when her contract uh, expired, her Reebok contract contract expired last year. Um, this was definitely one of the the top choices for for her as as an athlete. And also like it's kind of tough passing up living in Boulder. Um, but then um, uh, the team was kind enough to take us both out on a visit, which I was I was really thankful for. Uh, and I had never been here before. Josette had spent a few summers here, uh, back in back in college. Um, so she had she's already she's always talking about Boulder, 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 Boulder. Boulder. Mm-hmm. And um, so for me to finally get out and see it, I was I didn't want to like try I didn't want to like be pushing her one way or the other too much. But when we left, I was kind of like, uh, yeah, I think this is kind of the spot. Yeah, uh, it's pretty good. And so then um, we uh, we got married December 9th and went on our honeymoon Costa Rica and then 6 days after that we uh packed up our shipping cubes and moved on Christmas Eve from 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 Charlottesville to Boulder. Uh we went right to uh Tori and Jackson's for Christmas Eve dinner at 10 p.m. and oh no we did it we did a 4 mile shakeout because she'd already taken like 2 days off before that. And, you know, it it mm-hmm. was a wild, it was a wild couple of weeks. Um but then uh yeah, so then we we got to spend Christmas in Boulder. Yeah, it is crazy that you guys moved on Christmas Eve. It the flight was like it's too good to pass up, yeah. which I couldn't believe. Yeah. Um, and then we, and we flew with my with our two cats, Cuff and Link, and um, it was just we ended up getting an upgrade to first class, which was pretty cool. How about so, that little yeah. Christmas present? Little Christmas Christmas, can- well, yeah, but we were delayed uh, seven seven and a half hours in Jeez. the in the airport. Okay, but, uh, so not that good. <laughs> <laughs> not worth it. Not yeah. worth it. The trip. Yeah, give and take, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you guys had a very interesting fall because yeah you knew that you were looking for new options because the Reebok do people even like talk about publicly what happened with the Reebok team um is that like public knowledge I don't know yet um we don't even totally know what's going on right now um it's we Josette she was offered something from Reebok um to be fair she was um it just uh 
if you like compare the the all the offers she she had the the Reebok was not the length was not the same, and so that was kind of um, and that was Reebok's what seemed to be their um, standing point was the length, and um, that's ultimately ultimately what uh, led her to leave because you know F- F- Coach Fox was an amazing mentor for her. I mean she she really really blossomed with him, and uh, they they clicked really well as as an athlete and coach. Um, I mean, it's yeah. What what they were able to to accomplish was nothing short of impressive. But so yeah, it, it was um, it was just it was really you know it was kind of sad in a way because they the that Reebok group had so much talent and they had so much success. Um, it 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 just seemed like it it wasn't necessarily coming. It wasn't it was out of Fox and and uh, Coach Smith's control. Yeah, well, the big thing was that. Like maybe they offered Josette a contract, but they weren't offering contracts to a lot of people. Is that correct? Like they, she wouldn't have had teammates, really. Most likely. So um, that's like kind I don't, of a sad thing. It was, yeah. So like, and then when you when you look at the teammates that she would be having at, at some of the other groups, especially here, it was um, it was kind of a not an easy decision of, uh, by any means, but like it was kind of like, well, when you compare them, it's like, well, I'm going to take the longer contract with Alicia Munson and and company (laughs) yeah it sounds like i mean like between the two of you and for her especially she had kind of decided what was important to her and what wasn't as important because i mean it's not easy to do especially i remember you maybe had the same experience coming out of college you have all these different contracts and you don't know like what actually matters you know but then i think pretty quickly like once you're a pro for six months a year you realize like what matters to you and what doesn't and that's obviously gonna be different for everyone like and it was the same thing for me where initially like I tried to stay with Mick and essentially be like solo like well I had plans to try have training partners but I thought that I would be pretty okay training solo and then I mean that's also like why I ended up with Team Boston and stuff but then mm-hmm. not having training partners you figure out pretty quick like <laughs> man running can be pretty boring sometimes <laughs> and, uh, yeah especially when it's not going well you uh you need to have like having a team or having something else going on in your life that's pretty significant is that something that you is it would did she feel really strongly that that's what she needed um or was that something more that you were like always like trying to make her see the value of uh we'll talk about me for a second first you know (laughs) Uh, but um i had that exact um realization that you had only a year later um so i i stayed with um with coach vidge uh the year after after my contract um so this is this is now 2013 and i ended up having uh, a hernia um in my in my groin and that was just i just i was not running very well and it was really really frustrating and i was still living at home and it was things just were not going super great and um then so then that that summer I kept seeing the NJNY guys all over and like they were at all the same meets and I was like man I think I I think I I think I miss a group uh, so I then I boys. so then I need the boys uh, so then I I um I joined NJNY that next year uh, in 2014 uh, 2013 2014 and uh, I was running better um, I was definitely happier with with the guys um, we had so much fun. Um, and shout out Mike Rutt. He just became a, a doctor of physical therapy. Wow. So that's pretty sweet. Yeah, who was on the team at that time? Who were your train, main training partners? Uh, I lived with Don Cabral, the Cabral Cannon. Um, nice. That was, uh, we, we've been described as perfect opposites. And um, <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> that means the only thing we have in common is that we run. Yeah. But in like the best way possible. Like we actually ended up clicking pretty well. Opposites uh, attract. Yes, absolutely. And um it uh we we had a blast um but i just remember there before before like workouts he'd be blasting like reggae tone in the, in the kitchen and he liked to wake up like two hours before the workout and he's just like having a dance party getting psyched and i was like kind of fresh out of school and and like i was still waking up like a half hour before the practice you know yeah and i just come up be like can you turn that down <laughs> it was just like some of those little things but um yeah. Uh, so it was Don, uh, then Kyle was there, Kyle Merber, um, Mike Rutt, Brian Gagnon. Uh, we had uh, like Liam Boylan Pett, Russell Brown was there that year, um, uh, Ben Sheets, uh, I think he was a D3 guy. Um, who am I missing? Like it wasn't like Johnny and like, um, and uh, 
like Kobe. Kobe, yeah, not yet. Uh huh. So it was that was kind of like the the next wave. Liam Boylan Pet, did I say him? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. And Gags was the coach. Gags was. Was the it co- just Gags? It was just Gags, and then he had his um. I don't. Uh, no Hilly would come sometimes to like help time. Mm-hmm. Um. And Trout and I don't know if Troutman would come around yet. Um. But it was just Gags, and he. He would drive like I think it was like two hours or something down to New Jersey for for the practice. We actually worked out at Donellan High School, or no, it wasn't a high school, the Donellan New Jersey Public Track, which is the town Sydney McLaughlin's from. Wow. So there was one time when, cause and that's when Sydney was still in school. So there was a, there was a day that she was like doing a practice or something, and everyone's like, I think that's the high school girl, and it was just it was pretty funny. Yeah. But- <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, she was still pretty good back then. Um, but yeah, so so then I um I came to realize then after that I I needed a group, but I needed a coach that understood me as a person and as an athlete. Mm-hmm. And not that Gags didn't understand me, but it was tough only seeing him twice a week. And uh, so I ended up going back to to Coach Vidge, and we were able to eventually kind of recruit some. Some guys to come come back, uh, especially Anthony Kostelak, uh, Virginia legend, uh, Abemaro legend, um, and then we uh, Peter Callahan that ended up coming back after he finished up at New Mexico. Um, we had Russell Dinkins, print another Princeton grad guy, had some wheels. Uh, then Patrick Rollo ended up coming up from uh, Davidson, another 800 guy, and um, that was kind of. And then like the Princeton guys, uh, like they would like come in and out. You know, that's the thing, like. Every year you get a new group of freshmen, and at Princeton, Vidge some seems to always get these insanely talented guys. Um, so we there was always like a like a little kind of group there, and that ended up being kind of the magic formula for me. Yeah, that's what worked well. Yeah. Did you know that I visited Princeton? I do. I've heard when that story many times. Time. Yes. <laughs> at one point, <laughs> at one point, I think you and Grant Fisher had both visited yeah. i don't know if i don't think it was the same weekend but i and then there was like one other like stud that visited and vidge was like yeah if, if we got everyone that visited we'd have went like one through ten at ncs <laughs> yeah it was a very very interesting visit i i got along with vidge really well i i mean i couldn't i didn't end up going to princeton because you know they don't give out sports scholarships and and all that type of stuff it would have cost me about a bajillion dollars to go there mm. But I really liked, well, my visit was just... You had, know, you had fun? I had fun, but yeah. it was, I don't know if you've heard the full story. I don't know if you heard Morgan's side of the story, but it was just the weirdest visit ever because I happened to be visiting on the week of regionals. And so for I didn't even like meet the actual team because the team was like gone. They were, <laughs> they were racing and I was hanging out. My host was Will Paulson. Legend. As a as a freshman, legend, and he, I'm pretty sure he just skipped all his classes while I was there, and we just <laughs> we just hung out and had such a good time. Um, <laughs> Paulson is um he's another extremely talented individual, and he's very um, good. I think he was injured at the time because mm-hmm. um, he, but yeah, so I think I can see you guys getting along really well. Yeah. It was just like everything. I mean, I was in, I had just finished high school, I suppose. And I was just like in the U S I'm like, wow, this is so fun. We, they gave us, they gave us money for meals <laughs> and we spent it all at a sorority poker tournament. It was like, it was just random. And then we just, yeah, we had a lot of fun. It was, so it was a good time, yeah. which I mean, I, I like, it was, I was pretty sad when I had to tell Vidge like, yeah, I just can't go there. Man, dude, Vid, Vid would have, uh, not that Mick didn't do a good job with you, but Vid would have, <laughs> Vid would have coached the crap out of you, yeah. Yeah, so so you moved back to, so you lived at, in Princeton, New Jersey? So I lived, yeah, right next door in Lawrenceville, um, and uh, and um, it was, so it was, my, my, where I grew up, I was about 45 minutes away from Princeton, and then I, I moved to be about 10 minutes away, which was, um, it's funny, 40 minutes doesn't sound like a long drive, but it was kind of like, the commute was kind of getting to me, yeah. uh, and um but where we lived, there was this amazing park called Mercer Meadows, and it was a uh, from it was a, exactly a mile to soft surface, a five mile soft surface loop. So from the house, I could do a seven mile run that was five miles of soft surface, and that was like game changer for me. Mm-hmm. I like that is I, I abuse that a lot. Mm-hmm. And then there's the towpath, which is like twenty or thirty, forty. I don't even know how many miles. It goes as, as far as you need. That's just flat dirt and straight. Um, and there's Princeton Cross Country Course. The, the training, the training around there was. It's a lovely place to be a runner. Yeah. Yeah. And um. 
and it was it was like easy to be focused uh it was easy to be focused and kind of like just in make a bubble for myself which was really really helpful and still having my my parents and my sister close by which was really helpful and my dad would come to a lot of workouts if if Vidge was at regionals or you know if he was at a a Princeton thing Mm -hmm. and um you know we needed uh like an assistant coach then my dad was very quick to step in and that was very very helpful and my sister was in nursing school at the time. She she came to as much as much as she could, which was wow. which was very sweet of her. Yeah, that's very nice. Mm-hmm. So, what year were you in Princeton until? So, uh, so I was, we were in Lawrenceville from the fall of fifteen until the fall of eighteen. So about three, just about oh, just about three years. Okay. And then I moved home after eighteen. That's kind of when I got I got sick with Lyme disease and. Um, Anthony Koslak uh, had been doing the oddest jobs you could find. I mean, he was really, he really strung himself thin to like make it work to train with us. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was ready to like <laughs> stop waking up at four in the morning to do a job just to come train in the afternoon. Uh, Callahan, uh, I think he was, I think he moved back to Chicago. Uh, Patrick Rollo was ready to um, also stop doing these odd jobs and um and russell i think russell had moved to philadelphia at that point i don't but it, it was kind of like everyone was kind of ready to to like part ways and um i did i wasn't ready to like get my own place in in princeton so i just moved home and yeah then i started dating josette <laughs> when i was living with history. my parents yeah the rest is history <laughs> but i mean i'm gonna try to get you to talk about like some of your great races i know you're very humble and i don't know it, it's like it is hard to talk about stuff that you did really good that's a long time ago. Because even for me, like it's not like I like talking about like when I went into the blaze. Because then it just reminds me that I haven't really done anything since that. Yeah, I guess that's the, <laughs> I guess that's the point. It's like we're talking about stuff ten years ago, not stuff that's a week ago. So I was like, yeah, I wish I was like. Did I mention that five mile run today? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but with that said, I think it still is very exciting to talk about that stuff and there's still like a lot of there's probably so many lessons i mean at the end of the day i always believe like you can take some really good lessons from the good times when things are going well and like yeah we'll talk about them but then like i mean you've had a lot of struggles in your career um i mean many people have struggles but you in particular you've had a lot of struggles you had freaking Lyme disease and i think when you come out like the other side like or at least when you're able to look back on them like when you're not right in the thick of the storm there's always like you know, those are the moments that you you come to realize those are the moments that you grow from the most and you always find like good lessons. So I would love to try cover yeah. a bunch of that stuff oh, yeah. if we can. I got to tell you first off though. So when I, like when I, I'm a big YouTube person, like watching videos all the time and stuff. I think a lot of people know that. And I would always watch videos to get me pumped up for races. Your NCAA win in 2011 was like, that was one of my races. <laughs> Well, thank you, Morgan. That was one of my races. Um, if so, anyone hasn't seen it, uh, type, YouTube, type it in the YouTube. NCAA 800 meter. It'll be, it'll blow your mind. I mean, <laughs> we'll spoil it now. Robbie wins, but <laughs> barely. <laughs> I re I rewatched it yesterday. Oh, nice. I didn't realize you were literally in last place with oh. 200 to go, and the race went out in freaking 49. So you yeah. probably just you probably just raced it the smartest kind of. Yeah, Charles Jock. Um, who, who ended up being second and then he won the next year which is so i don't i don't feel as bad anymore mm-hmm. like i used to feel i was like oh man i literally just stole it from him like so i, I beat him by 0.03 yeah and i'm like oh, i just i you know he led 799 meters and and you ran 144 7 1 144 7 1 yeah crazy mm-hmm. tied tied the meet record at the, at, at that time now yep. donovan donovan said see ya <laughs> <laughs> uh but uh cool story actually that um Amos Bertelsmeyer brought up uh, last week. We went out to Josette and I went out to dinner with him and his fiance uh, Piper, uh, some Georgetown friends, and uh, Madeline Perez, some some Georgetown folks after after the LA meet. Mm-hmm. And he brought up the prelim from that from that 2011 NCA race. And so the the story is that I I ran the race without any pins in my spikes. So I was wear, I was wear testing. A pair of Nike spikes at the time, and they were messing with the the like spike depth, mm-hmm. and they tried to make it less to make it lighter. Um, and I, I love the spike; like they were they were they were essentially the Victory Twos at the time. Um, I, I think I actually I never wore the Victory Two, but um, 
So I remember I'm on the starting line and we're like, we're walking around the starting line. I'm like, oh man, I'm looking at all these pins on the floor and I'm like, oh boy, someone's going to have a bad day. <laughs> and then I like go to like get set and my foot just slides out and I'm like, wow, oh my God, it's me. Yeah. So I'm like, and it, it, it had rained too. It, it, we're not uh, Des Moines, Iowa and it, the storms were coming and it was, it had rained. So the track was wet and I like, I'm like basically heel striking to keep myself on balance um and so i think i ran i think i ran like 146 9 closing like 26 to like to, to win the heat but i remember I, when i told vidge about that so then i take my spikes off and i use the horseshoe um <laughs> it's just there's only one pin on the top one remained one re- only one remained and it was wow. the one that you didn't use <laughs> so when i told vidge that he he just didn't say anything and he just, just pissed. he just took him out and oh, and, yeah. and, and walked away He's like, you're not wearing these ones again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that um, super noticeable that you, you didn't have spikes in them? No. He was like, you looked, he was like, you were right. Like, you, you know, you were running kind of funny. I was like, he's like, is something hurt? I was like, I was like, no, I didn't have any pins in my shoes. Yeah. <laughs> and he just, he just like, a, like he saw a ghost. I but, have a kind of similar story, but I never, I don't think we ever told our coach Mick my, fre- <laughs> my freshman year. So do you know who Joe Hardy is? He was my, he was a Wisconsin teammate. I know that name, yeah. As a freshman, like we like did, he was on episode like two. Oh, wow. Like, OG. Probably first five of the podcast. He lives in Seattle. He's from Seattle. And as freshmen, like we were the two freshmen that were competing for cross country for Wisconsin oh, nice. and the rest of the team were slightly older. Big deal. And they don't do this anymore. I think like we kind of ended this, but they would just room us together for everything. <laughs> Now they started, after that, they started doing a thing where they'll match up like freshmen with like older kids to kind of show them the ropes. But we were just like, we were just out of trouble. We were so dumb. Like there were so many times when um, we just did stupid stuff. Like we had regionals was at home, but we still stayed in a hotel the night. Make it feel like a meet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we got the time wrong for when the bus was coming. Oh my God. And... (laughs) Oh, you thought it was Eastern time? <laughs> yeah, we thought it was Eastern time. Yeah. Our clocks were off for some reason, even though we were just down the road. And we get a knock on the door from our team captain, and we're both just like naked on our beds with our be- bags like fully, like open. we just showered, like we're just... Taking was, your time, yeah. Like our bags were fully... We'd only there for one night, but somehow like our <laughs> stuff was everywhere. Man, we were just so stupid. Like they hit us. And what happened at nationals, <sighs> cross country, it was super muddy year at Terre Haute. And... I'm a size 11 and he's a size like 12 or so, like maybe 12 and a half. Like he's, he's a little bit bigger than I am. And we accidentally wore each other's spikes. And <laughs> how did he, f- I guess you can fit in a size See, under. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's always my thing. I'm like, to me, if, if I you tried my, on a 10, yeah. you would know it. That's the thing. I'm always like, like, it's still kind of stupid that I didn't realize that I was wearing <laughs> a shoe that was like a size too big, <laughs> but I feel like a size too small is even worse. You would feel that a lot. I, I, I think would. I think we were both just so nervous. Uh, National Cross is just like the most, especially with the weather and stuff in Terre Haute, it's just the most nervous, nerve-wracking setting ever. But I realized, I didn't realize that I was wearing the wrong shoes in the race, but during the race, in some of the muddy sections, I was slipping. Like oh. my, my, my I'm like... I'm surprised you didn't lose it. Yeah, like my yeah. foot was sliding like inside the shoe and it was really weird. So then afterwards, I was like, oh yeah, that's why that makes sense. Was that 2014? 2014 yeah okay is that the year um chess won yeah one of i guess he won of those, i guess he won a few of those yeah i'm trying to remember yeah but yeah wow so that was my funny story with dude Brian. that's um that's my shoe story yeah yeah that's wild yeah dumb freshman huh i'm i'm uh, i'm also a size 11 <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah but so yeah that 800 meter win was just oh so so yeah so anyway so now we're in the final and i have the right shoes on and um so Jock, Jock had already run 144 that year, uh, but he lost his conference meet to Ryan Martin from mm-hmm. UC Santa Barbara. This is I don't even know what the name of their conference is, but there's like they're just a bunch of California schools that are just living the dream on the coast. And um, so for for Ryan Martin for their conference meet to go 145, 145, and then I think third place was 151, but no, nothing ag- nothing against those guys. It's just like you don't see that very often. No. And uh, so for for Jock to not even win his conference meet, but then had already run 144, and it w- it was like we knew it was going to be a battle. And like Corey Prim had run 144 that year from UCLA, um, so there was there was a lot of guys. 
that were right around that like 144, 145. And I had run 145 the year before at NCAs in the prelim. But that year, my, my best was 146 from, the, from that prelim without the spikes. And before that, it was 147 at the regional because I, I was just coming into shape. So I just didn't really have many races under me. But, Vid, you know, Vidj was, he was an incredible motivator and he just knew exactly what to tell me to like keep me calm and keep me into the race. But he's like, Jock's going to go. He's like, he went out in 49 in the West region. He went out in 49 or 50 at, at his conference. Like, he's just, he's just going to go. And though everyone's going to go with him. He's like, it's, it's, he's like, this is a really good field, but you're, you're not going to get caught like in the back, like everyone's going to go with it, which is a bold thing to say, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. but he's like, just keep your eyes open and just keep trying to go around people if anyone's falling off. But so I just stick my butt in lane one in last place for 600 meters and I come through and I'm in last place in 50, 51, one, or maybe it was 50. Yeah. 51, one. And that was by far the fastest I'd ever gone out. I had like almost, all my races had been negative splits. And wow. uh, so, so Jock gets to 600 and like 115 and I'm like 118, I think. So I'm like kind of still, I'm just slowing down less than him. And with like 180 to go, just, I swing way wider than I thought I do, but I swing super wide and just get going. And those guys, I feel like those guys are moving in quicksand because I'm just like blowing by them. And not because I was running fast, but because they were just, they just went out 115, 116. And um, it's like, you, as a fellow closer, you know what it's like when you're catching the guy. And I could just feel, I'm like, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. And literally the step before the line, I just dip and we get him. And it was uh, just absolutely crazy. Uh, I was throwing up for 25 minutes after that like Seriously. like not no like Vidge couldn't find me because i was just throwing up it was i just ran so hard it was yeah. uh it was really cool and but jock jock was so so great afterwards like he he was like yeah you know i ran as hard as i could he's he like went for it he did he went he, yeah he raced like he's best race to that, win and it almost worked and it almost worked and like a, a week later a few weeks later he gets third at usa's and goes to daegu for the world champs Crazy. And I got and I got dead last. So, <laughs> so I think uh, hindsight, you know, would you trade? Would you trade an NCAA championship for a world championship berth? Um, that in that same season, that's a great question for you. I don't know. I think, I think the. I want to say yes, just because of the way it played out. Like it's it's such. It's one of the most to me. And I think probably for a lot of other people as well, it's one of like the most legendary races ever. So I think just for like that fact in itself, I would say if you had never gone on to represent the U.S., oh, then it'd be different. Fair. But considering that I know that you know <laughs> you went on to have more success and do it another time, I would say, you know, maybe that was the best way to work. It could have worked out because you got your big NCAA win, which is huge, and especially yeah, running 144 as you you were only 20. Yeah, sophomore. Yeah, as so 20 year old sophomore. And then maybe getting your butt kicked at USA's was a good thing to... I mean, that's what happened at Donovan Brazier. Like, it happens. It happens all the time. And then it keeps you motivated. I mean, you must have been... That is something I want to ask. Like, when you're 20 years old and you win into the blaze in 144, like, how do you feel? Are you just like... Do you... Does it set in? Like, are you just like, I'm the best runner in the world? For, for lack of better word, you're just dumb to it. Like, you just have no idea. Like, I, I wasn't looking at um like i didn't even know what the world standard was mm. i didn't know what the olympic standard was it wasn't until a year later Vidge is like well you have the you have the olympic standard and i was like what do you mean what's an olympic standard you That's know? So crazy. like you just all i cared about was winning the acc meet <laughs> it's like i wasn't thinking in this grand big scheme about it and it was um i just thought it was another race and it was it was really cool mm -hmm. but then it's like it kind of hit me at that at USA's um, uh, where I was like, oh man, like you know, Nick Simmons hasn't run 144 yet this year. Yeah. Like Dwayne Solomon hasn't run 144 yet this year. Like KD hasn't run 144 yet this year. And I I knew I wasn't. I knew I was losing fitness by like the day at that point. But still, like you know, we went in being like, dude, you can you can win. You could you could win. You could make the team. Like yeah. you're gonna be. It, it was, it was, and that kind of like popped me a little bit. Um, so it was definitely a combination, but I, 
I had a blast. That was my first senior championship because the year before in 2010, I, w- I did the World Juniors with with Kaz. Um, so that was my first senior championship, and um, it definitely helped me for uh, the next year, which was Olympic trials. Um, just being like around the seniors because it was like, man, these guys are big, and I'm just not that tall. And <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like, like yeah, it's you, like the, you looked very young you, at the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like Little you know, Kadivis K- K- Robinson. Like he finishes, he finished Rome, the Diamond Rome Diamond League, like um, in between the US uh, NCAs and USAs, and. Like so one of the interviewers asked him, like, why are you here, man? He's like, for my family. Like, I need money for my family. Put food on the table. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, so like for you to be like, oh, what, what, like, what, what are you doing at NCAAs? I'm like, oh, I just thought it was another race. Yeah. But it's like, so it, that definitely was like eye-opening. I'm like, man, this guy's like, these guys mean business. Like, this is a business. And, you know, they are they don't look at people as competitors. They they look at them as, I, I need to, I need to beat you. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was, um. Definitely eye-opening from that perspective. Because in the NCAA, it's like, you know, you, you get a bunch of goofballs. And, you know, kids are serious, especially especially now, though. But, like... Super not, serious now, but back then... Yeah, yeah, not that we weren't serious. Like, you know, I think, like, fourth place was 145-1 or something. Like, it was, like, a really deep field. Um, That's going to be some of the deepest, like, the 800 specifically has ever been. I, 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 in terms of depth, probably. Because, yeah. you know, Donovan and, and McBride, they, they ran much quicker. Um but yeah, I feel like in terms of like Just having top to bottom, guys. yeah, yeah, it was it was it was definitely a very solid year. Because um, even the year before, uh, Weeding won in one forty five, and then I was second in one. He was like one forty five, like six or seven, and then I was second in one forty six eight. So I, second place was a full second behind the winner, and then I don't. I think last place was one forty six in in that twenty eleven race. Oh wow! Well, I don't. Yeah. I think that could be. I could be pulling that out of my butt. But I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it was um it was really it was really eye-opening that that whole summer and then um to go back that fall uh that was actually that fall so now my junior year uh that was my only year i ran cross country and Vidge said don't worry like you're just going to be like sixth or seventh man like you're not going to score like but we just you know it'll be good training for you and um the team, the team got had a lot of injuries, and I, I ended up being our second man. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> not because I was running well, though, <laughs> kind of because the team kind of fell apart. Oh, um, but then that was so my last uh, NCA race, my last race in a Virginia jersey was uh, NCA cross country regionals 10k. Wow, which is pretty funny to think about. It is. It's kind of. A, it's not like a letdown, but it's like probably not uh, what you expected. Super <laughs> anticlimactic. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you enjoy cross country? Or are you a classic eight eight hundred fifteen guy who hits cross country? Well, at that point, I was an eight, I was an eight hundred guy. Yeah, like, pure eight hundred. Yeah, like I, I I had run, I ran one fifteen hundred, my freshman year, and then I ran, the conference meet as a sophomore, so I ran two, and that was it. So like, everything was on eight hundred. Uh, so you're like, I'm definitely not racing cross. Like I'm an 800 guy. Yeah, and like you know, I was I was fine in high school, um, but like I, I didn't make Foot Locker. You know, like I wasn't like um, I definitely didn't trend towards the two mile. <laughs> I cared way more about my four by four than I did my two mile. Yeah, you you came from a speed background. You told me you split a 47 in high school. Yeah, yeah, 40, 47, 47, seven, 47, eight. Um, speed boy. It was a and it was a real split. It wasn't a, it wasn't my dad from like the top of the bleachers or anything like that's my boy running forty seven. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, and then uh, freshman year at ACC meet, I uh, I handed off in the lead in the four by four. You legit. I, I was third leg. Legit. And um, that's that's before uh, the merge with all the other schools. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it was a pretty down year in terms of ACC four by four. But <laughs> still, it was pretty cool. You know, it was uh, yeah, that, that was fun. I split forty seven that day too. Yeah. Do you know who Austin Mudd is by chance? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Vidge wanted him bad. Yeah. Yeah. So he he's a similar, I guess maybe he's yeah a, similar eight fifteen guy. He was big man. And he was extremely talented. He had a really good close as well. And he was still around at Wisconsin my first two years. And Mick made him race cross country. And he was so funny about it because he he was just a really funny guy in general. But he would <laughs> really play up. Like he's like I'm like an 800 guy. Like why am I racing cross country? <laughs> he would always he would every single time he would just say, "You don't take a Ferrari on the grass." That was like he's lying. Like, oh he man, just always Dude, say, have there. There's an Alan Webb uh, quote. So I trained with Alan Webb for for a year. Did you know that? I did not know that. So I trained with Alan Webb in that that 2000 that fall of 11 to spring of 2012. Is he crazy? Um, he is. He's not crazy. He's just, he was so focused and determined 
that there was, he was he was the best at blocking everything out. Like there was there was zero distraction with that man, and it really showed. I mean, it was, and I, you know, I was still in, I was like college age at that point. Like I'm, it was like, and I, you know, I'm used to like just rolling out of bed going to practice. You know, like it wasn't it wasn't mm-hmm. like a gotta roll out, gotta get my electrolytes, gotta uh, make sure my shoes are are changed at the right time. Like it was just. And he was like, everything was just so dialed in. And because this is, so this is 2012. So he was a few years past his American record, but you know, he, he fully believed he hadn't had his peak yet. And Mm -hmm. I, I, watching him train, I believed it. Like he was was insanely impressive. And like, you know, watching what you guys do now, I'm like, you know, Web Web could train with you guys. <laughs> you know, he, he's like he could do that. Yeah, he was, he was amazing. He was he was he was incredible. Like, but like, you guys are good, and like I think I, like you guys are really you guys are the best. But like, I'm like I've I've seen Web do stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Not mm-hmm. I couldn't do it, but Web could do it. <laughs> uh, but so he said. Uh, so in Virginia, there's a ton of single track trail called on the Ravana Trail, and that was like the only place we ran, and we always rolled our ankles. And I remember like asking like we were going on a run, and I like just went to the trail, and he's like. What kind of trail is that? And I was like, a, a running one. I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> you can walk on it. The, the, a walking trail. The one we run on. I don't know. And he's like, you don't take a Ferrari off road. Yeah. And we turned around and you know, it, but like it's, dude, yeah. it's it, it, you're right. Yeah. It's it, you, why why risk getting hurt not on a run like on a run or whatever. It makes you sense. Know? It's uh so that that's funny you mentioned that. Yeah, he was just he but, was just so funny about it. Mm-hmm. He would send I don't know if you remember this is like a very obscure meme reference, but there was a popular meme at that time where there was like a young kid racing cross country and their parents parents was feeling them and he's just crying. And he would just send that to Nick as well. And he'd be like, this is he send that to Nick? Yeah, he'd be oh, like, this is me. Because he only raced like two. two. See, we have big meets at Wisconsin. That's the thing. So he would go do those, but just like the B race and just like, you know, he'd just do his thing. Like, it was, there's no pressure or anything for him. But he Do would, the best you can, buddy. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't even know how we ended up talking about that. Uh, 800 guys running cross. 800 guys running cross. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to ask you, because you kind of touched on a lot about your i don't know if ignorance is the right word it's not it's yeah. just like youthfulness yeah no. lack of experience Dude, ignorance is bliss man ignorance is bliss 100 percent. do you because i kind of feel like this sometimes mm. do you wish at times that you could go back to that more ignorant state when you didn't know as much as you know because i mean the reality is like this you can running you know once you go through the sport as a professional you learn so 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 much and you know there's like so much you can be doing and there's so much stuff that is in your control out of your control i think sometimes if you just didn't like know about all that you'd be like better off you just would not be stressful like not have the same stress but you know as you go through it you're like especially when you're dealing with injuries and stuff you're like i could be doing this 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 i gotta like go to bed at this time i mean i'm pretty big on like my routine and taking care of other stuff but has that been something that you i don't know if you would have ever had that thought where you're like man why can't it just be like the good old days where i just (laughs) i just didn't think uh yes yes and no yeah (laughs) i i wouldn't i wouldn't trade the experiences i had for anything yeah so for me to have the awareness to learn from those and you know, ultimately now pass that on, pass those lessons on to Josette and, and my friends, of course, uh, is, um, like you, you can't, you can't buy that from anyone. And it's so, it sucks that you have to go through that at the time, but I would not train, trade, um, what I've learned through those overthinking situations for anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, Mostly because I, I do I want to get into coaching, so it's it's um yeah I I do think it's helpful to have some of those a lot of those experiences. I think it's essential. It's, yeah, you know, and um especially if um from the injury side point um stand of view stand, yeah. standpoint um to have that to kind of have gone through that and it's a yeah it sucks but it's like yeah I you know I've had I've had planner before yeah I know. I know what to, I know what to expect. I know how to handle it. And, mm. it, but, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, 
it was definitely nice to just like show up to the race and just tear some faces off and just be like, yup, see you later. Yeah. And, into the blaze. Yeah, and, and um, just go to the beach the next day. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, um, I think, I think ultimately that that'll hold you back. And, um, cause I, it's funny cause I had like, I hadn't, I didn't know. I didn't even look at the West region results that year. Yeah. Vidge had to tell me that Charles went out in 49. Mm-hmm. Like, I, but like, the thought of like not even looking at that right now is crazy. I'm like, I was looking at the splits of like the B heat from Portland track fest. Yeah. And I'm like, what the heck did Matt Wisner to closing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so it's, it's, um, it's just different. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it was, I mean, I know that you feel this way. Probably he's just so good for you that you had a coach like Vidge that could look out for you and take care of you. But at the end of the day, yeah. Uh, this sport always comes down to the individual. You can't really have a coach. I mean, you see it in some scenarios, but you can't have a coach hold your hand to a, like an Olympic gold medal. Like you have to no. be the one Absolutely in not. the driver's seat at the end of the day. And yeah, that's just reality. And so to learn how to do that, yeah, you have to go through the tough times. It can't always be easy. Otherwise, you're just not going to learn Yeah, yeah, these lessons. You're absolutely right. And uh, that's actually, I remember, um, I remember saying that in an interview uh, when I kind of flip-flopped when I went, when I let, was leaving Gags, going back to Vidge, and I was like, well, it's me on the starting line. Like, it doesn't, nothing else really matters but what I feel and what I think. And if, if I think and feel that I'm going to run my best with Vidge in my ear, then that's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. That so, makes total sense. Yeah, so that, it's, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. yeah. One, this is like kind of an aside, then we'll get back into your story. Do you think that it's weird that I feel like maybe it's just a coincidence in the era that we're talking about the 800 like 2011 but just kind of around that time in general the 800 was raced so different in my mind there was all these like heavy hitters who just had the (laughs) biggest closes and they would all just go out in like last place and because weeding would do a similar thing yeah you had nick simmons Simmons, yeah trying to do the same thing Mm -hmm. um so yeah that's actually very that's that's um so i because Clayton, Clayton Murphy is, uh, he's, you know, obviously he's an anomaly. He, he has an Olympic medal, but he, he does not like being in last because it's usually not the best place to be. <laughs> Got a lot but, of ground to make up. But he, I would say, and Donovan, same. Like Donovan, he, he's run it that way as for like tactical reasons. But when he set his American record, he just said, no, I'm out of here. Like when he's running his best, he's in the front just front running it like a Rhodesia and Clayton is he really likes to be that mid pack or like that not mid pack yeah mid, in the mid in the mid pack or like second or third kind right, of like yeah, stalking his way up. yeah right and um yeah like so seeing like Simmons and you know Simmons when he when he got his uh, his world medal uh, I think he got I think he got a silver medal in 2013 yeah. he he starts in last like the first 200 but the home stretch from 300 to 400 he hammers that to get in better positioning so he like staying in last place until 200 meters to go generally not a great strategy yeah. if, if you're trying to beat guys that are as good as you were better like it's really really hard to like make up that much ground unless they run really poorly and went out way too fast and then they're going to have like a really bad blow up but you it's impossible to predict that mm-hmm. so yeah like but simmons was um I mean, I, I forget how many how many titles he won at uh, U.S. titles he won, but and you just knew well, you just knew he was going to be not maybe in loss, but just pretty much at the back of the field. Right. Yeah. You just like you just knew like there was no other way that he was going to run it. Yeah. Almost every time. And it's kind of because he was he comes from the the mile or he ended up being coming more from the fifteen. Like, it's it's tough when you're racing guys that can split forty four. Like, the, it's a different kind of speed. Yeah. It's it's um, like it even just like training with guys that are that are like 45 open guys or 44 split it's like they can just move and mm-hmm. it's it's really impressive but then like on the cool down they're like you know little puppy dogs you know yeah. but like, <laughs> i just i actually in college that's really funny i always remember being like oh man i wish this was a mile like looking at the field because i'm like all these 400 guys and i'm like oh man i just yeah what if this field was running a mile today yeah. that'd be so funny be crushing yeah but uh it was um yeah, that's really it's. Do so you think it's more it's just changed. a coincidence that like some of the 
best runners just happen to come from a more strength background and that's just how a strength guy is going to race an 800 totally yeah it's if you if you ask uh if you ask a strength guy so and a strength guy you know phrases whatever you want to say but like if you ask a guy who's better at the mile than the 400 to try to get to the front in 23 yeah. like that's not going to set him up to run his best yeah like he, like that kind of runner most likely i don't know i haven't seen too many milers be able to do that now that's it's different than when when if it's like if you're trying to run like you know 148 or something like you know you because then you can negative split that or something like like watching josh Kerr um this past weekend mm -hmm. like watching him he he made a great move on the home stretch to get into better positioning but he didn't get there at 200 because they were like 23 or 24 mm -hmm. well then Quebec hit the bricks but yeah. still it's um yeah that's just kind of the way it goes i don't know it's i think it was just coincidence i would yeah. say yeah what do you think I think that's probably it. And then, yeah, you got some anomalies. Like, yeah, Clayton's probably a good example of an anom anomaly because he could rip a crazy 1500, but I think he's 400 split is like a 45. Or yeah. Oh, he's, yeah, he's fast. So he's, he's, dude, he's scary. When he, dude, seeing him come into form right now, he is, he's scary right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, just kind of an interesting thought that came to my mind. Yeah. I, cause it's always so exciting when you have in the 800 someone come from the back. Cause I mean, you think of like Dave Waddle. Oh, yeah. You think of like, it's just like there's been some really exciting races where like that's how it's, it plays out. The 800, I think, is the greatest meeting meeting of the minds in a way. It's yeah. like you, you just, you have, there's so many ways, there's so many splits, I guess, to, to run the same time. And uh, yeah, it, it can look really funny in the race, but it, it's, it's really cool to see like, totally different athletes i mean look look at a thing mo it's like yeah. she she can run 49 she's then she had the ncaa record in the 400 and she's gonna try to run a really good 15 but it's like you're and then she's running against um uh who's a good example of a 15 uh sage. 15 8 sage Sa oh yeah Sa uh, sage heard of clecker ever heard of her <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and like so for sage to train train like a, a 408 girl would probably wouldn't work great for her yeah but for Mo, Mo to train like Sage probably wouldn't work for her either. Yeah, it's it's funny because you're 100 percent right. Where it's the only event where you have, I mean, maybe a little bit in the mile 1500, but it's the only event where you have like someone that runs like 20 miles race a week <laughs> racing against someone that runs like 80 miles a week. Actually, yeah, you yeah. know, like you because I mean, you have some guys that don't even like count mileage because they're so sprinter based. You know, yeah. it's 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 wild. Yeah. So hmm. it is interesting then looking at those kind of years of like 2011, 2012, your transition from the 800 to the 1500, how did that come about? Because you said- It's a great story, yeah. You were an 800 guy, <laughs> but then you ended up, did you make the Olympics in 2012? No. 2016? 16, yeah. The 1500? 15, yeah. So how did you transition? Like how did that happen? So in in um, so in 2012, uh, the year after the NCAA, the NCAA win, uh, I, I was hurt again during the indoor season. Uh, my my planner, naturally. Uh, Dude, it's kind of a hack getting injured during indoors, though. I think it's actually ends up working in a lot of people's favor it, sometimes. The trajectory. It's all about the trajectory, <laughs> yeah. and like you know, some t like I mean, look at Joe last year. You yeah. know, he, he hurt his foot indoor, and then he he wins the U.S. title. Yeah, that's just another example. Yeah. Uh, so I I ended up hurting my foot, so I didn't run indoor that year, and um. Then when I was training with Alan and Vidge outdoor, uh, you know, we very much, the goal was very much Alan in the 15 and me in the eight. You know, I don't think Vidge wanted like mm. two guys <laughs> kind of like. It's a tough one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also like I had no business running a 15. Like my my best at that point was 340 and I'd only run two of them. It's like, why would I, why would I run the 1500? Uh, so we, we get to uh, the Olympic trials. Um, well, so I, so then that, that summer at, at, um, at Oxy, you remember Oxy? Oxy. Oh yeah. The, Oxy invite. At, at, yep. Um, so at that, at Oxy, I ran 334, getting third to Mo Farah and Galen Rupp. And then Leo Manzano was fourth. So it was like, it's funny looking back on that. I'm like, that was 2012. It. I was like, damn it, why didn't I get a medal? <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So we ran, I ran 334, closing in 53. And what was your goal going into that race? If you oh run like three thirty seven, make just get a, U, a, a U.S. time. Crazy. And because because Webb was in the race too, and he was just like looking for for like a some momentum. Mm -hmm. Um, but so at that point I had run so that at 
And then a few weeks after that, I ran 145 flat uh, at the New York Diamond League, which used to exist. Uh, and uh, so I was, I was like, well, I think I'm just ready for the rounds. And like, I think 145, I know I'm going to run a lot better. Um, cause I, I was so nervous. That was my first race as, as an Adidas athlete. Mm. So I was insanely nervous for that. Uh, and, um, but so then we get a week, uh, a few days before the trials, we fly out and, uh, my hamstring kind of grabs on me and I was like, uh Oh, like, what do I say to Vidge here? Um, so luck, but luckily, you know, somewhat, I guess, uh, the 800 is the first uh, four days and then the 1500 is the second four days. So we ended up scratching the 800 and running the 1500 because I needed a few more days before I could run on my hamstring. Wow. So leading into that Olympic trials, I had run four total 1500s and I was about to run hopefully three. Yeah. But it, and it, you know, it went, it went fine. Uh, again, I got, I got so nervous in the, before the final, uh, there's actually there's a picture from the semifinal where it's um it's it's Leo and Matthew going one two and then I'm like sitting on them and the guys behind us are like gritting their teeth fighting so hard and the three of us are just kind of like cruising looking good and the, you know Vijay he's like how'd you feel I was like good like you know this feels this feels nice mm-hmm. so I like it way more than the 800 <laughs> and he's like yeah you're going to make the team. Yeah. And now that be, you know, weeding, weeding won his heat. I think he closed in like 51, him and Will Lee are closing like 51 to run like, you know, whatever they, they were in shape. They were in great shape. So like for him, it, but like it was going to be a really good battle for third. Um, and it, it ended up being a good battle. Uh, uh, weeding, weeding just got the best of all of the rest of us. And he kind of outlasted us. I think I would say his experience from that, from the previous few years, and like having already made an Olympic team is kind of what pushed him there. Like that would give him a big advantage. Mm-hmm. And, uh, cause then I, I, four years later, having had an Olympic trials experience, I felt so much more confident and, and I was, I was in better shape, but still, it, I, I do think experience is really hard to, to beat at times. It's, I'm really excited to see Centro at us champs this year. Cause it, it's, uh, it's, his ex- he has so much more experience than these guys, and yeah. um, just gotta have the you, you do need you do need fitness. Yeah, yeah they're, just, <laughs> they're just so good now. Yeah, it really. It, I want Centro to do well so bad. I do too. Is he? Would you say he's like looking at like the U.S. and all that, and especially yeah, you went on to run the fifth. Did you go on to just like after that championship? Were you like I'm a 1500 meter guy, or are you still like I'm an 800? Guy? Um, it's, so then the next year I, I tried to go back to the 800, um, but like I, I, um, I was hurt and I, I just wasn't in the headspace for it, but I, I also wasn't in the headspace for the 15. Uh, and then in 14 with Gags, Gags was like, you're, you're an 800 meter guy. And so I, I kept running the 800 and like, it's not that I was running bad. I was running 146s. It's just when you've run 144 and like, you're still 22, you're like, well, why am I getting worse? Like I should yeah. be getting better at this point. And, and my 15 also wasn't getting better. Like I hadn't, I wasn't even breaking 340 at that point. So I was like, I was just really frustrated with, with running in general. Uh, and then when, when I went back to Vidge, uh, the workouts for the 1500 were just feeling a lot better. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it, I think it was just kind of a natural progression. Um, and I think more so it just, it suited my running style a lot to like be closing down and, and, and being able to like not control how hard you run, but like it just, I just felt in way more in control in a 15 than an 800. And, uh, because the 800, like, you know, being in last place with 200 to go, it's like, I wouldn't say I was in control of that race. Like yeah. I definitely was not. Um, and, uh, but in, in the 15, like I, I felt like, I felt like I had way more to give in the in the fifteen. Yeah, like you could position yourself a bit better yeah. and like be more competitive like throughout the race and set yourself up for like that big close. Yeah, and in the eight, I like I honestly don't know how much. I mean, I never ran faster. That's still my PR. Yeah. And so like I don't know how much better I was gonna get. I did. I you know of course I wanted to run faster and I thought I was gonna be a one forty three guy. Like I I had thought about the American record at one point. You know, but it it just um yeah it just wasn't it wasn't in the cards and the fifteen just kind of came really naturally. So like it was um kind of an easy easy transition Mm -hmm. so my question was gonna be would you say Sancho became like your kind of biggest rival 
Man, I mean, dude, no one could beat him. I mean, Leo yeah. Leo was the only guy that could beat him. Um, but it, it's and then when I when I did beat him at the U.S. Championships in 2017, that was the year after he won the Olympic gold. He was going to all these events as Olympic champion. Yeah, he had got he him. got he hurt. US he, he said he was in Vegas for like the month before that. He shows up with bleached hair. We're like, oh boy, this guy. Like, what what happened to this guy? But he, so I, it was like not really much of a rivalry because um, the trials he won by almost a second. And then in 2016, he won by over almost a second. And then in 15, he had, he beat the field. I got second in that race, 2015. He beat, he beat, he beat second, third and fourth by two seconds. Jesus. It was like, that's a wild race. If you, I would watch that one next for, for all you YouTube guys out there. Yeah. His last um, 600 is 119. <laughs> which is 52 pace that is crazy but that's you know that's something that um he really he really worked on was his speed that year he, he ran 144 that year that was his 800 pr 2015 and then he i don't know if he's ever said it but i give a lot of his olympic gold credit to his 800 ability from the year before because to close in 50 point you need to be fast like yes you need to be strong but he needed that 144 speed to be able to to do that fifty point, yeah, because other guys in the field can do that. Yeah, McClufey got second in the eight hundred that year. He went one forty. I think he ran one forty two. You know, yeah. it's like, it's it's um. Now, that's again, that's a generation ago now. <laughs> than the races you're seeing now, it's crazy but, to think like how that the the tactics in it. You know, it's crazy to think how quickly things can change. But I mean, at the end of the day, you know that when you look back on like Centro or even like looking back at like. I know, you know, like looking back, like on what you do, but it's like going to be so legendary. I mean, you're know, like, yeah, I just told you, like I used to watch your 800 meter race to pump me up for races, but it's... Thanks, Marks. I do find it funny that like Sancho has, he gets a lot of, sh- I don't know if he still gets a lot of shit. He got a lot of <laughs> shit when he tried to go head to head with Cole Hawker. Do you remember that? And oh. all the young kids like hated him and like, do you know who you're like disrespecting? I know this is Matt Sancho. Oh, it's like... Dude, if, uh, <laughs> when, uh, who, who, who's the kid, uh... Uh, uh, Chris Christmas Christmason, I forget. Is that his name? I forget the kid from New Gen. New, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, know what you're talking about. But I he, his name. Carter. Carter. Yeah, Carter. Carter. When um, dude, if if I'm like if he if you're currently on the Oregon team and you're shitting on your Olympic gold medalist who's <laughs> yeah, an alumni, that is crazy to think about. Like the the balls you need to have, man. It's like. Yeah. I'm all for like pumping up Cole and Cooper, you know, it's like, you know, it, you can do that, but do not forget what, yeah. what came through that track before you and, you know, Centro. I think it's just the fact that they're like racing each other. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like, it's like in the moment almost. Of course, it's like, of course. Yeah. Whenever like Matt Centro retires and you look at his career as a, as a whole, it's going to be like, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, wow. He, he, his, he, he got his first medal in 2011. Yeah. It's crazy. That was a, a while ago. Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's a twenty-one year old. Yeah. yeah. But uh, do you think he's gonna come back this year? Make the team? What I'm really curious. I has he said who's coaching him right now? I don't know. I haven't been paying attention. I think he's. I think he said he's coaching himself right now. Interesting. And I would. But you know he has been doing this a long time. I just. I kind of like what I was saying before. Like I think he, he needs the right guy chirping in his ear. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, cause he's he's this, cause once he gets some momentum going, he's really scary. And I think I think uh, you know he didn't have the race he wanted at Portland track, but like L.A. like watching L.A. like him running closing one. down with Johnny and Prakel, it's like and and Drew, it's like, I mean, those are the guys kind of going to be fighting for the team. You know, I, you know, you throw in you throw in in yard and and um. You know the two guys that finished, or the guys yeah, that yeah. finished ahead of him, Cooper and Hobbs. But like, you know, in a in a tactical race, it's like yeah. th- that's going to be the final. Mm-hmm. So like, for him to be saying he's a year out of surgery, maybe not this year, but I think in a year from now, like, if he stays healthy again and, and he has the right guy chirping in his ear or, or the right team chirping in his ear, I think um, I think he he still his talent is is undeniable. Yeah. Yeah. I know nothing about his training setup. See, that's the type of stuff that is sad. Like we do get, we do miss out on because he'd be someone who'd be really interesting to have a camera following him around. And oh my gosh! Seeing how he 
operates. That would be so fun. Can you so, can you imagine? Yeah, let's make that happen. Let's do it, man. <laughs> <laughs> let's do you first. Okay. <laughs> We're trying. Yeah. So you mentioned your win at USA's in the fifteen hundred in twenty seventeen. Was that kind of like one of the highs of your career? Would you say? Yeah, I. I would. It's really hard to compare that to an Olympic trials because in, in Olympic trials, um, you would take third place in Olympic trials over over pretty much anything Mm -hmm. like getting on that team is is so life-changing it's the dream yeah but then so like having that like in my back pocket knowing that i already had that to to then win especially over someone who i respect as much as matthew it's like it it was like it was so cool and Mm -hmm. to be i was second the two years before that so like to, to feel that i was like coming on and like just I wasn't even I was like still improving it, it was it was a really validating run for me and um I was yeah I'm really really proud of that run but it's uh it's really it's hard to compare that to like the Olympic trials yeah because I I think my my um my race was better at the trials uh to to secure my spot on a team I think I ran a better race there but to to try and win to win USA's the next year um I definitely took a bigger risk and like risked getting fourth Mm -hmm. to try to win in a way Mm -hmm. uh it's a it's a funny race but um but yeah so it's it's uh yeah but i think beating beating an an olympic champion is is pretty cool the next year yeah the next year that was pretty cool now (laughs) very recent he he did have bleached hair you know so it it was like (laughs) he he was he he was not on the top of his game to to be it's the only year he didn't at a world championship or olympics that he didn't make the final it was 2017 crazy yeah. Or or nineteen nineteen, but at that yeah. point, at that point, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So were those those years 2016, 2017, You were training with Vig. Would you say those are the years that like things were really clicking? Yeah, that's like, you know, yeah. yeah. It was uh, not just the thing, right formula. Yeah, not that things were easy, because um, you, you know we we put a lot of work into getting that set up, but it was it was when we had the least amount of distractions, mm-hmm. and uh, it was. We just we were always on the same page, and the the races the races just made a lot of sense, and um, yeah, like the the goals were just always we we yeah we just really we were really sink, sinking up at that mm-hmm. point, and um, the just like the workouts that Vidge would come up with, it was just like looking back, it's just so cool to be like, how did you know to give me that? <laughs> yeah, and he's like, I, I just watch you run, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think you're always kind of gonna look at those time periods with some you know rose tinted lenses but it's absolutely i think it's very true when when things make sense when things are more simple that's when things are gonna just go well for you and i mean it sounds easy very hard to actually well, make happen in dude, our world dathan does an incredible job yeah. of trying to make things simple for you guys yeah. <laughs> like it's it's uh it's really really impressive to like see the effort that that he puts in for you guys and mm-hmm. just because coming from the le- uh the setup that josette and i had the last few years like things felt more difficult yeah just it's just it was a smaller operation for one and um you know with justin was injured so it was like there were and the team just wasn't as big so like there weren't as many people traveling to races so it was, it was at times she felt like she was on her own a lot and then i was i was lucky enough to have the time to, to travel with her for a lot of that mm-hmm. so like we just we just kind of had to make it our own, our own thing. Like we had a, we just kind of took control of it and, and made it that, you know, this is Josette's camp, Josette's mm-hmm. uh, uh, trip, you know, and then try to organize it like that. But, um, so now to, to walk into what some of the infrastructure that Dathan has set up and built from like pretty much nothing is, is, uh, it's really cool. To yeah. Like. And you don't take it for granted. No, not at all. Like, you know, her, her being able to travel with George from LA to to St. Moritz and like having Dathan waiting in the airport or train station for them, it's like you you, you just don't. You, where else are you gonna get that? Yeah. It's it's Little uh, things. it's really really cool. Yeah, having a nice gym that you guys yeah. live walking distance from. Pretty nice with Josette. Thanks, Josette. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, it's it was um things were just really really sinking and uh, like I I really wasn't taking it much time off from running just because I was like I was so healthy. Yeah. And um, my training partners, we, you know, we were all like kind of on the same page. And like, God, Anth, dude, the things that Anthony <laughs> and Patrick and Peter and Russell would do to like make workouts and practices, it's like it just blows my mind. Like how amazing it was, and you know, 
you know, like I said, having my dad and my sister to and my mom to support me, it's like it's really it, special. It's really yeah, it's really really cool. There's always like times like that. There's always like a magic about it, and you can't you can't make the magic. You can't manufacture it. It's just there, and you got to make the most of it while it's there. And then you know, for whatever reason, it, it goes eventually, and that's that. You got to look back and just reminisce, I guess. But, yeah, yeah, and like you know, I I uh, yeah, there's been a lot of a lot of like coulda woulda shoulda the last few years but i i i just you know i got a little unlucky got you know like maybe i got a little greedy i don't know but i just i got sick at the wrong time and i i didn't make necessarily the best decisions getting healthy and covid wasn't very helpful but i um then my, my killer it's like i just it kind of like it seemed like once I slipped off the path, I just kept kind of tumbling down. Mm-hmm. And um, I know about that. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, for a bit. don't even start, man. <laughs> you are, you, no, I'm fine. pretty, I'm pretty fine. sure he ran 15 miles at 440 pace today I at wish. altitude uphill. I wish. I wish. <laughs> Working my way back there slow and steady. Not, not stepping off the path this time. Going to no. be back. Do it right. That's right. But I don't want to spend too much time about this because I imagine it's just like really fucking annoying. But, what was the Lyme disease story? Oh my gosh. So I, um, so this was 2018. Um, and so it was a year after U S championship. And, uh, I had, I was a little banged up at that. <laughs> sound like a broken record, a little banged up that summer afterwards. Um, but I, uh, training had been going fine, but I noticed I'd started getting like really bad headaches. Like I, I would kind of get headaches. Like, I don't know from like, whatever i would just i would get headaches a lot but then these were kind of different uh and they were more kind of naggy like it was just yeah. like oh man like very painful god yeah it was just like man this it's like something doesn't feel right and um like i remember before uh, a swathmore race that year it was like my season opener i didn't even shake out beforehand because i just i just had such a bad headache and then after the race i got sick um and it was like I shouldn't have gotten sick. Like I, I shouldn't have thrown up, but like I did. And I was like, yeah, I, had a, I just have a headache. And you know, I was just like, huh? Like, all right, that's weird. Uh, and then so I ran a few more races and like they went, they went pretty well, but again, it was like, things were just not really flowy as much. Like yeah, it was, things didn't feel right. No, they did not. Um, mostly like my sleeping, like I just, I was always tired and, I'm a, I'm a sleepy guy. I'm a sleepy bear. Uh, <laughs> but this was, this was getting a little, a little out of hand. I would say I was like, man, yeah, I really shouldn't be needing to sleep this much. Like I've been doing this a long time. Like I don't need, I shouldn't it's be. Not, you know, you just knew it wasn't normal. Yeah. I know what a normal amount of tired <laughs> is from running 70 miles a week is. And so then a, a few races, I just like the, the only way to describe it is like a light switch would just go off. Like I would just be done. Mm-hmm. And I remember, um, so Vid, I actually, I hadn't seen Vidge for a while cause just cause of the, the NCAA meets were going off and he's like, what's going on? Like, you know, like he's like, you know, after a race or something, he's like, are you like, what's going on? I was like, I don't know. I just don't feel good. And he, he saw me for a workout after like a bad race and he saw the switch go off and he's like, uh, uh-uh, uh, like that's not right. That's not right. And, and I had gotten tested for iron and like, uh, you know, vitamin D, vitamin B, uh, like we, we, we were pretty thorough with it. Um, cause, we, and I, cause I, I like to get, to get that test like a couple times a year just to stay on top of it. So those numbers were like definitely fine. Like nothing that was like, oh yeah, you're just anemic or, oh yeah, you have no vitamin B. So no wonder you have no energy. And, uh, it's just, I don't know how else to describe it other than, yeah, I would just be, I'd be in it. I'd be focused, trying my hardest. Like I want to do nothing more than knock this workout out and just like, yeah. Oh no. Like that was like going from like a 68, like if I'm running, I'm trying to run like K's or like whatever, going from like say 70 to like an 85. Mm-hmm. And it's so, like, so initially it wasn't in workouts, but it started coming into your workouts. Initially. Yeah. So initially it was, and then it was more the races yeah. and I think it was the adrenaline like my adrenal glands were just so fried from fighting this disease. Um, and so I, I ended up having two co-infections with the Lyme and one of them attacks red blood cells. So they were just attacking all my oxygen. So it, like it made sense that I was having a hard time breathing and having a hard time like exerting a lot of energy. And um, 
you know, we found that out like months later, but then to, to try and cure it, try to, try to attack it, we went the holistic approach and that just did not work at all. What does that mean? We, we went to some... You drink we, a lot of green tea? Uh, we went to some cool doctors. Yeah. Um, I guess cool. I don't know if cool is the right word. We went to a lot of doctors and um, we were doing some unorthodox stuff. Like, uh, the yeah, we, we were... Um, my we're, mom, my mom's gonna be listening to this right now. She's gonna be like, "What are you doing?" Yeah, yeah. She's a she's a infectious diseases specialist. Well, I wish you you told, I wish you told me that on your visit to Princeton. Yeah, <laughs> should have gone to her. <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. McDonald. Yeah, <laughs> and because uh, because my sister had had Lyme and she went down that route and ended up running her best times that the next the next year. So it, it like worked for her. Oh wow, okay. And uh, uh. But I think it was the co-infections for me that were really because they it essentially just like masked the symptoms, and then once I started racing again, uh, that next winter, um, so for like it was it was during the summer that I started feeling the worst, and then uh, the treatment ended up working like kind of working. I could train like I was running seventy miles again, like which is my full volume, and then by the that winter, as soon as I started racing again. I was like getting sleepy again. I, I couldn't like really look you in the eyes. It was, it was, that's going to be the most it, frustrating thing. Well, yeah. And that's when I was kind of first dating Josette and she's like, what's this guy doing? What's wrong with this guy? <laughs> like I, I, it was really frustrating. Like the, the, the fact that Josette stuck with me through like <laughs> my sleepy bear phase is, is like, you know, for her to see me who I was through that is pretty incredible. So she's, uh, she's a good girl. And, uh, I'm really lucky to have her. <laughs> but, well, yeah, dude, that is just like so sad. So that, That's so the then, uh, so then that summer, <laughs> after that summer, when things like were just they went from worse to worser, and uh, w- I went and got uh, some antibiotics going. And Wait, is at, this still 2018? Is this 2019 now? This is 2019 now. A whole year later. A whole year later, yeah. Yeah. And um, and it, within that, I had uh, some bone spurs removed from my ankle. Cause my ankle, I just had no dorsiflexion, uh, so I got those bone spurs removed to try to get my calf better, mm-hmm. which ended up working. But um, you know, so I had a surgery and I had and I was still not recovering from Lyme very well. So that was kind of a double whammy. So that so that summer of racing was like it, I couldn't. It wasn't even a thought. And then that next fall, so fall of nineteen. So we're not even at the nineteen World Championships yet, in in October. You know, yeah. and um, I'm able. I'm finally like. I'll never forget when I I woke up one day and I just it was like someone turned the lights back on. Wow. It was so weird. But I'm like I come downstairs and my, my mom she's she like she likes looking at you in your eyes <laughs> and she's like she's like Robbie do you feel better? <laughs> and I was like yes she's like oh my god you're back. That's amazing. <laughs> it was it was real I'm like did I look that bad like oh my god. But it was um it was really really cool. And, uh, I was, uh, I went gluten free for a while, uh, gluten and dairy free for a while. And I think that helped me a lot too. Uh, it definitely, if nothing else, it gave me structure to my, more structure to my diet. And that was really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. So I did that. I only, I ended up only doing that for probably six months. And then I kind of started integrating it back in. Cause I, I just I, I just love me a sandwich, man. Yeah, man. that's tough. It's <laughs> and tough to and so now we're at the point where I'm 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 fine with gluten again. So it wasn't celiac or anything. It was just kind of a gluten intolerance. Yeah. And uh, I think I just kind of my body might have just needed a break from it, or it was trying to like find something to get rid of the. It was fighting off everything that it could. So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know. But um. So then since then, uh, the lime has been like not even a question. So since basically since 2020. Yeah. Well, thank God that story hasn't. Oh. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say I've gotten back to running well, but it's it's um, in terms of like being a sleepy bear and like being able to life. hold a conversation. General, general, general life. life. Yeah. Like everything is. I would say it's back. Like this is how I remember feeling. Like yeah. it's it's uh, I don't know. I'm still pretty funny. I'm still pretty witty. Mm, you know. I, I got go that far. Yeah. You laughed in the parking lot the other day. <laughs> Fine. So it's it's uh, things have been going um, pretty really really well since in terms of Lyme since then. Yeah. I just uh. I had Achilles surgery in March of 2020 and um, that was, ended up being a good thing because my Achilles really hurt, but that just uh, took a long time to get back, get my feet back under me. 
and um you know i'm i was happy to be training again especially out in boulder it's like i it's so beautiful out here like you know being surrounded by seeing you guys and mm-hmm. it's like you know helping josette and alicia out in a lot of their workouts in the in the winter it was it was just really cool and you know i i definitely uh kind of got the bug a little bit again i'm like i think you know i yeah i can i like watching yard run i'm like i can beat him <laughs> <laughs> It's like well, why? Why not? Why not? So it, you know, it's it's been really nice to be um to be around around you guys, and uh, I I definitely want to want to give it another shot at least oh, yeah. at least to run more years. So like everything I was just saying about Matthew, I, I was really saying about myself. <laughs> it's like I just I just want to give it one more shot, and I I know if he can do it, I think uh, I'll give myself a chance to to do it too. Hey, why not, man? Yeah, why not? You gotta chase those dreams while you still can. These kids aren't getting any younger, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we'll start to wrap up here. But one final kind of question I had in wrapping up is you kind of have mentioned a bit how you've taken on a very supportive role with Josette in particular, kind of like towards the end of the Reebok contract when like, yeah, things were a bit weird with the team and stuff. Kind of like you and it through that mindset, what are the main things or one thing, a couple of things that, you know, you find yourself saying a lot to her, like kind of from your experience in terms of like what is important as a professional runner or just a runner in general, what are like kind of like, what's kind of your like mindset with trying to help out someone else that you're so close to? Definitely. You're right. I'm wrong all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's probably the number one. You're right. I'm wrong. As your partner, that's correct. Yep. And that's oh, wow. You look so nice today. You were beautiful. <laughs> oh my keep, God. Just affirmations. <laughs> Uh, it's it's been it's been really 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 cool to see Josette's uh, trajectory in the sport. Um, she was she was a high school phenom. I don't know if I don't know if you know that. She was really really good in high school, mm-hmm. and um, coming from a, a small school in North Jersey where not really known for their running trails. She played basketball until her junior year of high school. Like she was just she was a mega talent, and she got a little un- she got really unlucky in college pretty much until her fifth year um where she was finally healthy and then uh that was 2019 at in austin i don't know if you remember uh running ncas there or not no yeah i don't remember i don't remember watching you either uh and so she she just when i when when her and i first started dating she had just found out she had a femoral stress fracture from getting bit by a dog that winter. That's crazy. So then three months later, she had a femur, femoral stress fracture exactly opposite of where the bite was. So it was just like her body just went into overdrive to try to correct, to try to heal, and it just snapped her femur. It's crazy. crazy. So so then, because um, that was her senior year, and I'm like, oh, finally, she's going to graduate. Like, you know, we start dating, she's going to start, she's going to graduate, move up to New Jersey. And she's and then as soon as she, she redshirted, She's like, I'm going back for her fifth year. I was like, no, I can't be going another down year. to college another anymore. Year. Dating in college, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, it just took her a long time. You, you know, femoral stuff is really frustrating, mm-hmm. almost as frustrating as sacrum stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it just took her a long time to to kind of get back into running. But um, I just, I remember um, something that, this is something Josette would say is, uh, I would just like kind of ask her how her runs would go on any given day. And I remember she used to just be like, good. Or like, like, you know, one word, quick answer, you know, whatever. And then after a while, she, she'd be like, why do you keep asking about my run? Yeah. And I'm like, I just, I, I, you know, I love it when my dad or Vidge or someone asked me how my run went. So I wanted to know how your run went. Yeah. And she, I was like, is it okay? She's like, yeah, it's kind of nice. <laughs> and I was like, okay. She's like, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, so that very early on, that taught me like, just show interest and in, which I, just you know, being, it was genuine interest. Yeah. Yeah. Just being a supporter, like nothing yeah. more, nothing more complicated than that. Just being a supporter. That's a huge step right there. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, I, I remember we were like crying with happiness. She ran 1602 in the 5K indoors at Iowa State of her fifth year. And we're like, Oh my God, this girl ran a PR finally for the first time in five years. Yeah. And we're like, we're so happy she can like finish her college career happy. And like a few months later, she runs 1529. She gets fourth at NCAAs. 
and she signs with Ray. Ray's talking, asking me about her, mm-hmm. and then now she's got a contract offer. I'm like, a year ago, this girl was ready to quit. Like, and then she, so then she gets to Reebok, and it's the COVID year, so. Um, Fox was uh, he took he took kind of the hey let's let's keep everyone separate approach like we're not gonna meet and uh, just get your runs done if you want to like get a bubble with somebody like so if, you know then that's fine so we ended up kind of bubbling with uh, Tori and Jackson uh, Tori's on Tin Man Jackson's uh, he's a bandit boy with me but he's mm-hmm. a marathoner he's qualified for the trials uh, next year and um, so we would like run with them a lot and. Uh, during that year and then they then races started opening up that summer but it's not like we had been training they'd been training super hard Mm -hmm. so and i I just had surgery so i wasn't running at all and so the races went really bad like she actually ran a time trial and she ran like 444 in the time trial or 439 439 sorry but she got under 440 but it was like oh man like all right, I don't know if uh, we need to change something or like something needs to change. Yeah. And um, that just that just absolutely lit a fire under her butt. Mm-hmm. And after that, she was like, that that sucked. And then she, she ran like 15.58 and 5K a few weeks later. And she's like, yeah, that sucked. Like that's one, that's not me. And two, I don't want to lose. Like I hate losing. Like she's just so competitive. So that... Again, talking about experiences, her having that experience, like nothing that I could have said to her would have changed, would have, you know, you, until someone kind of gets that fire going, until like you have that experience, I think yeah, she needed, she needed that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that really kind of sparked her, her coming out party, which was, uh, uh, I don't even know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but the, the, the trials of miles in Austin that February, mm-hmm. it was, um, <laughs> So sorry, Morgan. <laughs> That's when I sprained my ankle. If anyone's wondering, <laughs> started with long string injuries. Uh, so that was far and away the best race of her career. Um, at that point, she she ran fifteen nineteen to qualify for the Olympic trials in the five k, and she beat Emma Coburn. Mm-hmm. She beat a bunch of girls that like she was like, I didn't even know I could run be on the same home stretch as them. Yeah, but. For her, it was just, it was really cool race. And it was a pretty lousy day to run. It was like so humid. And yeah, there's a lot like, of like top performances. Yeah. Just based like, on the weather. I, th- I think there was only one Olympic standard achieved that day. Um, and Ellie, for reference, like Ellie Purrier only ran, um, like only ran, she only ran 1509 or 1508. Um, and she's, I think she's run like 1440 or so. Or yeah. she's, she's run significantly faster. Like it was just, it was not a great day to run. Mm-hmm. But uh, so then that kind of, so anyway, so you take that in consideration, how lousy of a day it is to her for around 15, 19, and like take the lead, push the race, push the pace. And then her next 5K um, in California, uh, she runs 14.51. And she closes down on a lot of good girls. She beat Emily Sisson that day. She beat Rachel Schneider-Smith that day. And two, two people that went on to make the Olympics that year. And so from like on paper, it looks like this big jump from 15, 19 to 14.51. But she more realistically probably ran closer to 15 minutes in that uh, in that Austin race, mm-hmm. and then you throw in that was the, that was when super spikes were finally available to people. So she was finally wearing super spikes, and so when you when you throw all of that in, it's not like she just had this drastic change. It's like well, one she started training with a professional professional team and coach. Two, she got in a really fast race. Three, uh, she had really nice shoes on. And three, she just got better. It's like when you train, you get better generally, you know. But she's a talented girl. I don't know. So it, it was. And she had Robbie by her side. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> dude. Fox, Fox is uh, dude. His training, his training. I, I still try to wrap my head around his training. It is, it is. <laughs> I've heard about it. It's crazy. It's crazy and it's different. It's just yeah. different. And like, like he, he'll give you a fart lick that will make you question everything on this planet. What, and then, what does that look like? four by or six by two minute on two minute off yeah and you finish that and you're like wow i'm the worst runner in the history of the world and then you get to the track the next workout and he has you do like a thousand at at mile at 15 pace and you're like it's extremely like joseph accidentally would run so fast sometimes because it's just like you're just so strong from the hills and from the fart lake or whatnot Mm -hmm. but yeah it's uh you know she just she really clicked with with that kind of training and she's 
clearly clicking with this training. So I kind of think she's just a talented girl, which is what we already knew. But yeah. it's uh yeah, so it's it's been really really fun to for her to allow me to be by her side, and for her to uh, like allow me into that space. And I'll definitely never. I'll never forget the last few years being able to travel with her to the Diamond Leagues and and, uh, and European races and even and the U.S. races, of course. But like, it's just uh, it's just it's something that I'm never gonna forget, and it's just so special, to, especially watching her watching her run. Well, like it's like you know, I it, it didn't matter how she was running, but because she was running so well, it was like this is Very just exciting. it's I I was I was never running that well on the European circuit. So to like see someone that you're so you you're so in, cared you're so intertwined with invested in it Mm -hmm. it was um because then it makes her happier and you know then that makes me happier so it's it was like it's just really really cool and you know to see her her ensign to have a good one in florence last weekend i'm like we're pretty hyped now and you know she does she's good man they don't need us you know they got they're doing fine (laughs) they don't need us at all i I think that's the elephant in the room yeah they they don't need us at all (laughs) it's too true well on that note is there Anything else you would like to talk about or mention or shout out before we finish up? Uh, I just, uh, I'm just, I'm blown away by uh, the talent and dedication you guys have. It's uh, the, and by you guys, I mean the the OAC team. OAC. It's it's been. Um, I, I kind of I remember saying it on a, on a run uh, when we first got here, but like I feel like every few years my my eyes get opened up to something brand new, and uh, like I. At first, I had no idea what a five k guy even trained like, and yeah. then I met Justin Knight. And then I was like, oh, wow, like, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> and then I met you guys and I met Joe and I'm like, oh, that's what those guys train like. And I'm, so it, it's, I just kind of chuckle whenever someone's like, oh, you ever going to move up to the 5K? And I'm like, I have seen things I can't even explain to you that I can't even comprehend see, doing in practice. So it's just, uh, I just think it's really cool to, to see you guys uh, all be on the same page. And uh, I appreciate that you keep including me in that, even though I've been injured the whole time dude people don't forget man olympic finalist <laughs> is pretty cool you know and you know it's uh it's you know you know we, we can talk about your ncaa races if you'd like you know no, no, it's no, no. it's uh i think that's a great place to us to, for us to end up but um on, on next time we'll have <laughs> you can interview chick, me next chick, time. chicken morgues over the grant fisher yeah <laughs> that's the dream uh volume but, one through three <laughs> well we appreciate you a lot. It's very so awesome to have you here, along with Josette. But thank you very much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, Mark. So good. Um, you ready, think, to, ready to play some uh, Tears of the Kingdom? Yeah, let's go play some video games. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, oh, for listening. Oh, well, really quick, what did you think of that uh, pasta and meatballs the other night? Amazing. All right. Thank you. So you heard it. You heard it from not me. It's good food. Great food. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Morgan. See you. Yep. <laughs>